Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's theCUBE. Covering IBM World of Watson 2016. Brought to you by IBM. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live at the Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas for theCUBE as part of the World of Watson coverage of Silicon Angle Media. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Dave Vellante. We're pleased to have two super influencers, VIP influencers here on theCUBE. Tamara McCleary is the CEO of Thel Thel Thelium? Thelium? I'm a geek, right? So geek? it's Thulium. 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 It's on the periodic table of Thul elements, Thulium. so you know. Thulium, with my <laughs> eyes checked there. And Chris Penn, <laughs> VP of Marketing Technology at Shift Communications. Both have uh, great backgrounds. Chris, uh, we knew each other when you started PodCamp. I did PodTech <laughs> and that podcasting uh, days kind of evolved. But you know, you've been on the social side, really from day one on the, on the ground floor, President Creation. Now you're starting to see a whole other thing going on. Tamara, you have a variety of diverse experience. Being a geek, being in healthcare, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Thank you. So as part of the VIP influencer program, you guys get flown in uh, by IBM, and you're on your own, so you're out there to, you know, obviously high profile on social, so you have a lot of audience following you guys. But your job is really to, you know, align with IBM, but amplify what you see. Not being directed what to say, but to what you guys see, and that's a real positive thing. And so first question is, for both of you guys, is what are you seeing? I mean, obviously, the evolution of IBM and seeing where they've come from, Chris, You've also been part of the practitioner analytics group with Watson from the day one. The world's changing. What's, what are you guys seeing? What's happening on the floors? So, what we're seeing now is an evolution from, think about companies having a sort of five-part structure, right? At the bottom, they're data resistant. No, no data, you know, let's just do things the way we've always done it. And then they become data aware. Hey, there's this thing called data. And then they become sort of data curious. What does it mean? What happened? They become data guided. Like, okay, why did those things happen? What insights can we gather? And eventually they become data driven. They become a data driven company where we say, you don't show up at this meeting unless you bring coffee, donuts, and data. And what's happening at, at IBM Watson, World of Watson is that these companies are, who are now data aware and maybe data curious are express elevated up the, the hierarchy because of tools like Watson Analytics that give you the ability to give analysis skills to non-analysts. People who, like you say to somebody, hey, would you go over you know, at lunch, can you just go run a quick analysis of variance on this thing? Most people are going to go, nope. <laughs> yeah, too much that. time, hassle, yeah. my data guy's on vacation. Don't know how to do it. Yeah, they'll, yeah, they'll, yeah, they'll say, what, is, what are you talking about? So we're seeing that evolution happen with analytics, but what's even more impressive that we've been seeing on the floor is IBM is making it easier for companies to actually work with the data itself without a huge IT and data science team. I just sat through a session on uh, Bluemix Connect and the ability to just pick up entire data sets, move them, clean them in transit, and then drop them off on the user's lap will t completely change how we manage data. Because right now, think about social media, right? How much is there in, in the Twitter API? There's about 250 fields in the API, give or take. That's a pain to clean. And yeah. yes, you know, the existing tools can do it, but if you now have these tools that can clean it, scrub it, get it ready for you, and it just shows up on your desk yeah. in a pre-contained format, why wouldn't you do that all day, every day? Yeah, it can manipulate. It becomes part of the code. Yeah. It's it, part of the programming, part of the execution. It's beyond code. That's the thing that's important, is it's beyond the technical users. Now to the business user, you have this thing. Yeah. John, you don't need to write code to have this thing. You can have that visualization on yeah. your desk in the morning. And they tell that citizen analyst is the buzzword that they use, but basically it's push button like reporting mm -hmm. with all this intelligence. And Watson brings this automation, and the, I don't want to say AI, because it's not true AI, but it's a, it's a vector to AI. Tamara, you know, you're seeing that, right? I mean, the, you're seeing where it, what it could be, even yes. early days now, but it's still good now compared to what it was a year ago. I think uh, to Chris's point, what I think is exciting this year is we're seeing a lot of practical applications versus talking about yeah. cognitive. How long have we been talking about cognitive computing yeah. but not seeing the actual use cases, the practical use? And you know, to your point, Chris, is you, know, you have marketers who now have to be technologists or at least tech savvy. Yeah. And then you have the IT department that's trying to keep up with being consumer centric. And now we have things through um, the conversational pieces where you don't have to be a technologist to write code to use that um, interface. So that conversational interface is pretty exciting because I think from the IT standpoint in an organization is you can hand it back to marketing and go, okay, 
you fill in all the blanks and then you can hand it back so that my team yeah, doesn't I mean, get, doing IBM gets some, some, some dings on the marketplace on Watson not being ready. And when, when, when they showed it initially, they were clear about that. They weren't saying that, and it did get a little bit hype, it did win Jeffrey, so there was a buzz there. But they were very clear, like, look it, we know there's a lot of work to do. And it got, as, as they knew they had to do more work, it's gotten better. So I think this year, my takeaway from what you guys are seeing as well is, it's real this year. Yes. yes. So the, re the reality of the, what's real is the practical use cases. So well, what are some examples? What are you seeing? Well, I'm seeing really exciting things in the healthcare arena, such as the partnership uh, with Watson and the Jefferson Healthcare System. And it goes beyond uh, uh, looking at cancer patients and Watson being brilliant at figuring out treatment modalities um, that are very specific to the genomic sequence of a tumor. Instead with like Je Jefferson Healthcare System, what's really cool is Watson taking a very human component and actually being there in a patient's room so that a patient can talk, ask questions, and be answered by Watson. A patient can ask about visiting hours, you know, what time is lunch served to tell me about my doctor. And there's, you know, if you ever are in a patient's room as a guest or a family member or, you know, a patient yourself, it, what you find is that you're in a very vulnerable position. It's incredibly scary. You're awesome. not at the hospital yeah. because things are great. But to have that uh, human piece, that component that Watson brings through that conversational interface and that dialogue, a chat bot essentially within the patient room, it, it's, I think it's transforming yeah, that's, care. Well that's interesting, so in April we had put a post out there about the, it was just a story that came out of the woodwork. Watson correctly diagnoses women's Cancer. Uh, cancer after yes. doctors were stumped. It's got 10,000 shares on Reddit. It's going, you know, went super viral. But that really is the awakening moment, you know, so to speak, where, oh my God, this is a real life example of value. I mean, you can't get any more valuable Massive than life. Value. I mean, come on. Right. So and in this example, Watson is uh, in, in the room or at least accessible to a, a patient or a patient's family. So I can ask any question, because when, you're right, when a doctor's <laughs> in there firing, you know, you get the fire hose of stuff, you wonder later, well, did he or she mean this, or do they mean this, or what exactly did they say, and you try to guess. And what it's accomplishing so, is, you're really ministering to that individual to yeah. support them and have them feel cared for, but you're also uh, decreasing a lot of load on your staff. So usually they're interrupted to answer these questions or to change the TV channel or do the things that they don't necessarily need to be doing as healthcare <laughs> professionals, right? So you're also decreasing the load on staff by having Watson present in that way. And John, to your point with that case of the woman, I think that Watson is democratizing healthcare across the entire population so that no longer is your level of care or treatment plan going to be dependent on your socioeconomic status and whether or not you could hire the best doctor or go to the best hospital. With Watson, Watson would be able to figure out yep. your best treatment plan that your physician can carry out and it won't matter, you have the best of the best and it's not dependent well, on your financial Well also on that socioeconomic status. thing, that's a huge deal and I'll tell you that one thing is you could put Watson out in the field as close to the edge as possible to augment maybe potentially the talent level of the doctors. Say it's yes. a, say they or can't. where there aren't doctors at all. Yes. Right. That's, the, that's the key is yes. for low income areas, you will have places where Watson can be that first line of defense. Like, hey, and the other thing that's interesting, it kind of goes back to the self-driving cars yesterday. When a human makes a mistake, yep. that human learns from it, right? They go, that's great. When Watson makes a mistake, Every instance of Watson now knows how to fix that. So Tamara may be seeing a doctor uh, of instance of Watson, it misdiagnoses something, but if I have the same thing, it has learned from the mistake and the whole system becomes smarter. So it will very yeah. rapidly be the smartest doctor on the planet. So you're an RN. Yes. So I want to go back to this other example of Watson as sort of this in-room assistant. Um, there's also, there's another side to that, which is, you know, sometimes you would ask the nurse, like, What's really going on? You know? <laughs> exactly. What, what really are my chances? You know. Okay, so can I filter Watson? I mean, what's the, what are the, the ethics of how you communicate to to patients? Because a lot of times, you know, doctors are told or nurses are told, okay, don't really tell them what the real chances are. Just be positive. So how does that all work? I, I mean, I think that's a great point, Dave. And I think Watson is going to be best harnessed and utilized to take care of the conversations that a patient needs to have that don't require 
a medical professional. I still think those conversations about what do you think my prognosis is? You know, am I going to die? Am Probabilities. I, okay? I mean, that's needs, what Watson's good at, right? And that, but that <laughs> needs to come. That's where that human piece. That's where I think that Watson is there to support and augment physicians and nurses, but not replace them because we do need that human piece. You need. I mean, Chris, you need someone to talk to you about that piece and not just get it. I trust Watson more. <laughs> well, the state of the art today is. You're getting the information from Watson, but Watson, then, then you're taking it and communicating it human to human with the good data mm. and information that you get from Watson. Right. What other industries, um, there's a chat going on for the IBM mobile team right now, and the question I'll ask you guys since we're going on a little social interaction here, it's on CrowdChat. Uh, what industries do you think will be most impacted by cognitive and how? Anything. And I'll live into it. So think about, <laughs> think about you have routine and non-routine tasks, right? So your routine task, empty this trash can. You also have cognitive and non-cognitive tasks, right? Non-cognitive, empty this trash can, right? It doesn't require a lot of creativity to do that. What's happening is that these AIs are becoming cognitive so they can create. There's a great demo here of Watson Music, right? And you can put in a few notes and it will infer and interpolate a new song out of that. Where we're going with this is that the machines can already do routine. The machines can already do non-cognitive. Watson has proved we can do cognitive, and now Watson is proving we can do non-routine, which means that we have to seriously think about in the next 5, 10, 20 years, what are the roles of people doing work, right? You will still need that doctor to, do the, you know, to, to deliver the news, but you may not actually need the doctor to do the diagnosis because the machine can do it better, faster, more accurately, um, and predict better outcomes. All these people here who are doing things like cleaning and emptying trash cans and stuff like that, we may or may not... They're also live streaming too on Facebook yes. Live or Periscope. Hey, exactly. <laughs> we may not necessarily need as many of them. Yesterday was a landmark day. Budweiser had moved 45,000 cans of beer from their distribution facility, from their manufacturing plant in Colorado to yep. their distribution facility. Self-guided truck. No human driver. Okay, so no drinking and driving. It's Budweiser for <laughs> sure. I couldn't resist that comment. That was a joke last no night. No open containers. Unless you're Texas. <laughs> so what? Well, the list of the, what? What can humans do that machines can't? Nothing. In the next five to ten years. In the next oh, five to ten years, we will still have creativity. We will yeah, still have the curiosity. Conversation with each other. We will still. We still need to relate to each other. But when you look much further out, we. Are you, if you're familiar with the works of Frederick Engels, kind of going back to like the 19th century, yep. a lot of the ideas of things like original socialism was to say, we can get now machines to create this bounty so we can focus on things like art and music and finding out what we're really good at. If you wanted to become a Buddhist monk, it's economically kind of tough to do that these days, but if the machines provide... It frees you up from the routine stuff that you can focus yeah. your creativity and energy on. Right. And this brings up the question I wanted to get in about the impact to the mobile experience, because now, if you take the connected cars and you go that to the connected humans, yep. okay, hence more automation to free up our creativity, what's the impact to the mobile experience? Mobile is, I would say, mobile is the second platform, right? Desktop was the first, mobile's the second. The third one really is augmented reality, and we're seeing yes. that here. Um, Tamara was talking earlier about you know, healthcare examples of where all of these machines are coming together, but that is the third wave. That's a different experience. There's a great booth here. Uh, the Watson Analytics team has uh, virtual analytics, so you can actually step inside your data, wander around and go, I want to see more of that chart. Um, and that's a different experience than mobile itself. Right, and I agree. I think it's moving beyond mobile and into augmented reality. And I wonder even if in five years from now we're talking about mobile, I don't know. Yeah. We may not be. We may have components that we're aware that are inside of us. There's a great exhibit in the real-time streaming of a cardiogram that is connected to a sensor inside a patient. And Watson can say, that is an abnormal uh, heartbeat. Call, you know, and we'll notify the doctor, hey, go check on this patient. Or it might just be, Chris, that you had five cups of coffee, I don't know. That, that's <laughs> entirely possible. The personalization is just incredible. I mean, just the user interface with augmented, certainly virtual reality, is going to change in what immersion means, right? Mm -hmm. You yes. can immerse yourself into any experience. Okay, what's the coolest thing you guys have seen? So you've been, I know you've been, I've been watching the Twitter feed, you guys have been out looking at the self-driving truck out there, a lot of things, there's been all kinds of stuff happening. What's the most exciting things you've seen? The I coolest think thing. Chris just named 
beamed the one, which is the embedded sensor, into a human being that could actually be life-saving. And you know, it completely cuts out having to do a battery of tests that happened to be randomly on the wrong day, and you didn't have that irregular heartbeat. And it is yep. VTAC, and it will kill you. But because of a sensor now, it's, it's picked up. And you and you stay alive, and I think that's how, how much more cool can it get that's than cool. that? I mean, this is the future we're living into. It's like we're living into a science fiction um, novel, and all of us get to play in this space. And I just I, I'm I'm wild about saving lives, human lives, and making yeah. human the beings coolest thing, Chris, in, a, you've seen? in a better place. Blue can't say that because you already said that, but we'll give you another one. Coolest thing so far has been the integration of Bluemix Data Connect with Watson Analytics. We have all this data, right? It's everywhere. These tools can now gather it up for us, clean it for us, and get it ready for us. So it expands the capability of people to make good decisions. Like business analytics is cool, but the ultimate goal is make better decisions. And now what we're seeing are these yeah. tools that make it so easy that we should see significantly better decision making by any company that embraces this stuff. So we had Eric Hunter on yesterday, Michelle Peluso, the CMO, was on earlier, and, and it was interesting, we were kind of riffing on like, you know, what's going on, and Eric used this example of, it's a two-dimensional world, and now a three-dimensional creature comes in, sees different things that changes the, what people now look at, changes the, the observation, and this is now bringing another dimension. So it used to be like, we go to the shows, hey, technology intersects with business value, outcomes. That's kind of a boring concept now. When you add in social impact and social justice, mm -hmm. you now have a third dimension of where this is going, to your point. So there's a really important point there. There's a story by ProPublica Pro recently about an algorithm that the police developed for predictive criminality mm -hmm. that was heavily biased against African Americans and completely wrong. It was 20% accurate. So one of the things that the citizen analyst has to be very vigilant about is that we have to watch our machines. We have to know how they're thinking. Yeah. We have to provide checks and balances to say, hey, you know, this, yeah. Katamara, we don't like people who are, you know, wear red scarves, so we're going to bias okay. the machinery against people wearing red scarves, so we need, that's, that's the flip side yeah, of we this. We came out of the cube at Big Data SV, our other event we do with, uh, in conjunction with Strata, is that you need algorithms for algorithms. Yes, so and So there's the QA and the human enroll uh, part of it. Well guys, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it, good to see you. I would like you guys to just spend a minute each just to kind of describe what you're working on. Um, I know you guys are out, uh, you have your VIP influencers here, but you have got, you're doing, all, both doing some work out on your own. You should take a minute to share what you were in Tamara, start with you, what are you working on? What's getting you excited these days out in, out in the wild? Uh, what's getting me excited is harnessing the power of cognitive computing in the social marketing space. So with social media account-based marketing, and learning the patterns and behaviors in that B2B enterprise space when you're looking at selling difficult solutions, how do you reach the right people at the right time on the right channel? And so right now working with Cognitive on you know, a better way to do that. Awesome, Chris, what are you working on these days? This is exciting. At Shift Communications, one of the things we're working on is understanding influencers better. So we are pull, using cognitive computing, entity and topic, keyword modeling, personality insights, everything that's inside Watson to do, understand why is an influencer an influencer. So if you look at Tamara, we published a tweet earlier of a network graph. Why is she influential and who does she influence? These are really important questions yeah. and w this is not theoretical, this is in production yeah. now. Yeah, it's not just the old model of, hey, she's got a lot of followers, it's mm -mm. what's the impact, what's the network effect, what's who the interest influences effect. Her? Who influences her? Exactly, so this is all data driven. Yes. It is, and I think what's nice about that is to your point, is that it's actually giving validity to what we're doing. So it's no more vanity metrics, it's here's the proof, yeah, yeah. and it's giving us a more powerful seat at the table. Well, the ROI has always been elusive in social, it's always gone from that blue sky period of, you know, it's, it's pioneering, but now as it crosses the chasm, it's all about data, value, Absolutely. relevance, context. Yes. ROI the is context. only elusive if you can't measure things. Chris and Tamara, thanks for coming on. Big fans of you guys, great VIP influencer program. Of course, theCUBE, we're doing our share to pump out as much content as possible and influence you guys out there. Go to ibmgo.com to check out all the, all, the, all the code. That's our new site. And also go to siliconangle.com and youtube.com slash uh, siliconangle for all the videos. Of course, we're live here at Mandalay Bay. We'll be right back after this short break.